Hey, Thomas. Thanks, Dean Scharf. I, uh, I want to, first of all, welcome all of you as everyone filters into our, our webinar here. Uh, the numbers are rapidly climbing at the bottom of my screen. I know uh, it's the start of the school year. It's the middle of the workday for, for many of you out there. And I want to say thank you on behalf of the American Red Cross and Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to come enjoy a bit of Star Trek and a bit of international law. My name is Thomas Harper. I am the senior legal advisor for the American Red Cross's international law team. And my background is an act of defiance with all of the Star Wars behind me. But trust me, I'm a Trekkie at heart uh, in, in spite of my massive Star Wars fandom. And I could not be more excited for this event uh, when Dean Scharf reached out to our team uh, with this great idea for this presentation. We jumped on it immediately, and this has been a really, really great partnership. I want to turn it over now to uh, my esteemed colleague, Christian Jorgensen, uh, legal advisor for the Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Team, uh, who's going to give uh, Dean Sharp's introduction. Christian, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Jorgensen, and I'm one of the legal advisors in international humanitarian law at the American Red Cross National Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Outside of the work that we do advocating for policy within the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, uh, we also do a dissemination program, which intends to educate the public about international law and international humanitarian law. When Dean Shar first shared his article with me on Star Trek, I knew it was something that would benefit a lot of people. Often we think of learning law as something that requires textbooks or you know, the, the best journals out there, or really something that's truly academic. When in actuality, we can watch it and we experience international law on TV, in movies, um, and throughout our daily lives. So before uh, I introduce Dean Scharf, I would like to just say a few things about him. Um, Dean Scharf is the coding of the law school at Case Western Reserve University since 2013 and is the co-founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group, which is a Nobel Peace Prize nominated NGO. Throughout his career, Dean Scharf has been a highly respected member of the international legal and policy community. And this is from his work in transitional justice across Africa and the Middle East to acting as the prosecutor of the Cambodia Genocide Tribunal. This long history of work is not only notable in its achievements, but also because it has impacted many in a positive way both people individually, groups, and also the system of international law in general. So with that, I will now pass it over to our speaker, Dean Michael Scharf. Thank you so much, Christian and Thomas, um, both for the kind uh, words and for co-sponsoring this event. So the um, American Red Cross has been amazing over the years. I've had a chance to work with them and the um, International Red Cross, and they are one of the most important NGOs um, and most impactful NGOs in international law and humanitarian law. Uh, this is also uh, in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the endowment of our Frederick K. Cox International Law Center at Case Western. And so this is a, a really big year for us, and it's a great way to kick things off. So when I was talking with Christian and Thomas, uh, earlier in the summer, they told me that on May 4th, which all of you know is Star Wars Day, may the 4th be with you, the American Red Cross hosted a event called Learning the Law Through Film, Star Wars and International Humanitarian Law. And they said literally thousands of people joined them for it. It was a huge event. And they wondered if I would be interested in replicating that because I had written an article 27 years ago, but one that is still cited frequently about teaching international law using Star Trek, the next generation. And I jumped at the chance. It's, it's a lot of fun and it's a good side um, 
track from some of the work I'm doing with genocide with the Rohingya in Myanmar and some of the, the other really horrible things that are going on in the world. Yes, we should talk about international law and have a little bit of fun. So Star Trek, as anybody who is on this show uh, or who's joined us today knows, has been around for a long time. In fact, today is the 55th anniversary of the very first episode of the original Star Trek. And so on the screen, you see the original Star Trek with James Kirk and um, Dr. S Dr. Uh, um, Leonard Nimoy and Mr. Spock and Scotty, you know, all the originals. And then after that, there was a cartoon version where they used their voices. And then a generation later was Star Trek The Next Generation. And it brought Star Trek back into the worlds of many people. Um, and that was about the time I had just finished my first major book about the Yugoslavia conflict. And I started watching, binge watching Star Trek to get my mind off of it. And I realized that all the things I'd been writing about in this book were actually playing out in Star Trek The Next Generation. Now, since then, there's been Star Trek Deep Space Nine. There's been Star Trek Voyager. There's been Star Trek Enterprise. Currently, there is Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. And my, my new favorite is the new cartoon, Lower Decks, which is hysterical. It's, it's really, really great. All of that is on television. But meanwhile, Star Trek has also been permeating our culture through movies. And there were the original six Star Trek movies starring the original cast. And then there were four movies starring the Captain Picard cast from Next Gen. And now there's been a trio of three movies starring a new cast um, of Star Trek. And the movies all have done quite well. And so for 55 years, Star Trek has been a big part of our culture. It's been so big that I would say more people, including law students, know about Picard than they do about Pol Pot. More people know about Klingons than they do about North Koreans. And more people know about the neutral zone that separates the Federation from the Romulan Empire than they do about the DMZ that separates North and South Korea. It's really something that everybody can wrap their head around. Um, and it's because of that, a great teaching tool. Also, some of the things that have been developed in our culture over time were first thought of on Star Trek. The flip phone, um, that came out of the Star Trek communicator 55 years ago, decades before it was created as a device that many people had. There's a picture 55 years ago of, of James T. Kirk, the captain of the Enterprise, holding the precursors to floppy disks way before there were even laptop computers or desktop computers. And then you've got pictures of a touchscreen computer way before touchscreen computers even existed. So if they could dream it in Hollywood, it would end up in reality, thanks to Star Trek. And of course, Star Trek has come up with some of the most famous quotes. Everybody knows, um, you know, Mr. Spock, live long and prosper quote. Uh, maybe no less well-known is Scotty saying, Captain, Captain, the engines, they cannot take much more of this. Or Captain Kirk saying to uh, Spock, sometimes a feeling is all we humans have to go on. Uh, you've got Ensign Chekhov who says, it was invented by a little lady from Leningrad, which he said about everything. Uh, Dr. McCoy, who would say, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Um, then fast forward to Next Generation where Captain Kirk or Captain Jean-Luc Picard would say, make it so, um, or engage. And then Lieutenant Commander Data, the android would say, I am superior, sir, in many ways, but I would gladly give it all up to be human. I mean, these are things that many of you are just reminiscing about as you hear them. But do you know that sometimes life imitates art? For example, when the President of the United States four years ago decided to create Space Force, uh, the, the fifth branch of the armed forces out in outer space, for the logo, they used the logo that you see there, which looks totally ripped off from the Starfleet Command logo, um, totally. And then, of course, uh, last year when the entire government 
put all these resources into trying to get a vaccine for the coronavirus. What did they call it? Operation Warp Speed. Does warp mean anything? No, it's just a word from Star Trek that means faster than light. It's not an actual faster than light uh, physics term. So all this shows you how much Star Trek has permeated our collective consciousness. You know, a lot of law professors have written about how you can use famous works like Shakespeare to talk about law or Dickens to talk about law. And I started thinking, why not Star Trek to talk about international law? And so that's why I wrote this article, which uh, 27 years ago became this crazy hit. Uh, it went virtual, it went viral. Um, and then it was even uh, republished in a book called Star Trek Visions of Law and Justice. So in the article, I posit that the Starship Enterprise is very similar to the day of the fighting sail, the, the age of mercantilism. And back then, you had a country's vessels being used for diplomacy, for economic trade, for making war, for exploration, everything that the Starship Enterprise has been used for. Well, also on Star Trek, you have the Federation of Planets, which is an awful lot like the United Nations. In fact, the Federation insignia looks almost totally like the UN insignia. But did you know that the General Assembly Hall of the UN looks just like the United Federation of Planets Great Hall in San Francisco? And even though the UN General Assembly is in New York, it started originally in San Francisco. So a lot of parallels there. Now, in several of the, um, the television episodes, international law comes up. And so what I'm gonna do for the next uh, 45 minutes is walk you through some of the international law controversies that we have today and how they played out in Star Trek The Next Generation. In one of the episodes, The Hunted, there were revelations about the Angosia Three government's mistreatment of its genetically altered soldier class. And that convinced Captain Picard to recommend against Federation membership for Angosia Three. Similarly, in one of the episodes called Attached, Commander Riker tells the Kess ambassador that he's going to submit the following report on Kess's application for admission into the Federation. He's going to say Kessbridge, a, a deeply troubled world, social, political, military problems that they have yet to solve. The Kesprit, while friendly and democratic people, they're driven by suspicion, deviousness, and it is the opinion of this officer that they are not ready for membership in the United Federation. Well, that kind of thing happens in the real world too. In 1991 and 1992, there was a conflict in the former Yugoslavia. And at the time I was an attorney advisor at the US Department of State, I was actually attorney advisor for UN Affairs. And the issue that we had to figure out is whether the resulting countries, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, and Montenegro could each become new members of the United Nations. Well, it was easy for most of them, but Serbia had engaged in ethnic cleansing and genocide. And there were major Serb war criminals who were wanted by the world's newest international criminal tribunal. And so it took Serbia more than a decade to prove to the international community that it had moved beyond the genocide, that it accepted accountability, that it was um, no longer gonna wage these ethnic cleansing wars before finally the international community in 2001 admitted Serbia into the United Nations while the other countries were all admitted back in 1992. Very similar to what you saw in Star Trek but the Star Trek episode occurred a decade before that. Well, then there's this issue called non-interference in internal affairs. And you have a number of episodes where this comes up. In the drumhead, Starfleet Admiral Nora Sati is prosecuting a number of people for a conspiracy and she gets around to pointing her finger at Captain Picard. And she says, you know, Captain, you have violated the prime directive 
non-interference on nine different occasions. And he, uh, he says, um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. In another episode, A Matter of Time, he says, you know of the prime directive, which forbids us from interfering in the natural evolution of a society. I've disregarded it on more than one occasion because I thought it was the right thing to do. Now, this is interesting. It's called the prime directive. It's super important. And yet he, he just ignores it when he thinks it's right. How does that apply to the experience of the real international community? And here, Article 2, Paragraph 7 of the UN Charter is the equivalent of the prime directive. It says, nothing contained in the present charter shall authorize the UN to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. And for a long time, the UN was based on that. But it turned out that when there were crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, genocide, that the international community felt that it was important for the United Nations to get involved. And at first they tried to make up excuses like whenever there's crimes against humanity, there are refugee flows that destabilize the international system. And for that reason, this isn't really a domestic event. But soon they realized that that wasn't even the issue. The issue is something that is that horrible that is going on is the international business of the entire community and they need to intervene. So you see um, Operation Uphold Democracy where the UN intervened in Haiti when General Raoul Cedras and Philippe Biambe overthrew President Aristide and started ethnically cleansing and committing other crimes against humanity. You see Operation Turquoise, that was in Rwanda in 1994 um, during the genocide by the Hutu, the Hutu against the Tutsi people. And you had a UN approved operation to stop the genocide ultimately. And then you also had the operation that um, responded to the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo by Serbia in 1999. All of these show that the prime directive for the United Nations has now taken a back seat to what Picard recognized was more important, humanitarian considerations. All right, treaties in Star Trek. This is a copy of a treaty that is shown on the screen, the Treaty of Our Men's. If you read the fine print here, it actually is gibberish. It doesn't actually have treaty terms. Um, but they talk about the treaties on Star Trek as if they're international treaties. And it comes up in a lot of cases. So there's a Federation Klingon Treaty of Alliance that includes a pledge of mutual defense. It seems an awful lot like the North Atlantic Treaty, which created NATO, or the, Wa the um, Warsaw Pact Convention that uh, created the equivalent of NATO for the former Soviet republics. Now, treaty interpretation becomes important in a lot of Star Trek episodes. One of them is called the Ensigns of Command. And in this episode, there's a group of people from the Federation who have colonized a planet. You can see the planet there, it's absolutely beautiful. And the Shaliak Collective are a foreign alien race that actually have territorial sovereignty over this planet. And they show up and they say, Federation, you get your vermin off of our planet or we will kill them all. And they say, we have a treaty that gives us the right to reclaim the planet and requires you to remove them. And so uh, Captain Picard looks at the fine print in the treaty. And interestingly, it's like, you know, what happens in the real world, um, here's an example, in 2003, uh, North Korea decided to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They said they're doing it effective immediately. But Article 10, Paragraph 1 of that treaty says you can only withdraw from it under certain limited circumstances. So first of all, you can only do it when there's extraordinary events related to the subject matter of the treaty that have jeopardized the supreme interest of the country. And second, you have to give six months notice. Now, the president of North Korea did not give six months notice, but he did say that because the United States had invaded uh, Iraq, that it was likely that it was going to invade North Korea. And that was a change in circumstance that jeopardized their supreme interests. 
and therefore they had to withdraw immediately. The international community looked at the terms of the treaty, just like Picard does, looking at that Shelyak Treaty, and they say, sorry, you can't just withdraw immediately. You have to give six months notice, and therefore your withdrawal is not sufficient. And that led to a whole series of UN sanctions on North Korea, which we're still dealing with today, trying to get them to walk away from the development of nuclear weapons. Now, Picard, in his exploration of the treaty, found a little known clause, an arbitration clause. And it says that either side could pick the arbitrators. And so Picard, being the brilliant uh, strategist that he always was, he picked an alien species that were hibernating for the next year, which gave the colonists enough time to evacuate orderly. Um, and there was nothing the Shelley Act could do about it because the arbitration clause was in their treaty, just like in the real world, right? All right, let's look at another example. What happens when a country violates a treaty? Well, this happens in Star Trek in the Pegasus. Uh, this Admiral Pressman shown here develops an experimental phasing cloaking device, which allows a starship to become invisible and actually pass through matter. And it's very experimental. In fact, it didn't work so well. The starship in this case got stuck in an asteroid. And um, at this time, the Romulans are closing in. Captain Picard is closing in. They're all moving in to try to, to um, find out you know, what should happen. Well, in the, that show, they threaten Admiral Pressman with uh, getting in a lot of trouble. Like you could go to jail for violating the treaty. It's a really serious thing. And it made me think, well, what happens when you violate a treaty in the real world? Well, if you're a small state, it can result in sanctions, even use of force. So for example, Iran, as it was developing nuclear weapons, uh, the international community imposed sanctions on it through the Security Council. Iraq, when it invaded Kuwait, the international community authorized Operation Desert Storm, use of force to force them to evacuate Kuwait. And when people commit war crimes or crimes against humanity, there are now international tribunals. Uh, there was the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Cambodia Tribunal, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And now there's a permanent international criminal court. And it has jurisdiction over crimes committed by any of 123 state parties if the crimes are in their territory or committed by their nationals, or if it is one of the non-state parties, there's about 192 countries in the world, um, when the Security Council refers the matter. So now there is individual criminal responsibility in international law. And then usually international law is enforced through reciprocity. If one country violates a treaty, the treaty partner can stop complying with the treaty. And then there's something called systemic reciprocity. If one country starts to violate something like, let's say they, they invade countries for humanitarian intervention, but that's not allowed, other countries will start doing the same thing. Here's an example. The United States did that in Serbia in 1999. And then a couple of years later, Russia invaded Crimea and South Ossetia, Georgia, you know, part of the former Soviet Union, and used the US precedent as its excuse and its authorization. So that's systemic reciprocity. You've got to be very careful in international law about the legal arguments you make, because whatever you make today can be used by your friends and your enemies in the future. All right, so also in Star Trek, there's a lot of episodes about diplomatic relations. And in this case, you've got the Vulcan ambassador Spock's dad on a mission to establish diplomatic relations in Sarek. You've got um, lots of cases where alternative dispute resolution mediation is being used. Uh, so on the top, loud as a whisper, in the middle, the outrageous Okono, and at the bottom, the host. Well, Captain Picard is even selected to arbitrate which of two Klingon leaders should head the high council of the Klingon empire in redemption. And so this kind of thing, arbitration, also happens in international law ever more frequently. In fact, 
now more than international litigation, countries go to arbitration. And then arbitration, basically you have an uneven number of arbitrators. It could be one or three or five or seven. And they are picked by the two parties and the odd arbitrator is picked by the other arbitrators. And there is a permanent court of arbitration in The Hague at the Peace Palace, but also arbitrations are usually held in Paris and in London, in New York, in Vienna, in Hong Kong, and, um, and, and in Geneva. And so if you're an international arbitrator, that's a, a great life because you get to spend a lot of your time in some of the best cities around the world. In the price, the enterprise serves as hosts for negotiations for the use of a stable wormhole by Barzan, which is basically a phenomenon that's like an international strait between two bodies of water. And the wormhole connects two parts of the universe. So the question is, what's the international law that governs international straits? And the law of the Sea Convention spends a lot of time developing that. International straits are very important for international community to be able to travel. And there's lots of rules governing that. Um, you could not sell an international strait as in Star Trek. So they got that one wrong, I guess. Another example of uh, Star Trek dealing with modern day international issues is in Force of Nature, where the Federation learns that traveling above warp speed five is actually ripping the fabric of space. And so they decide to have an international or an intergalactic speed limit. They recommend that nobody go over warp five except for in cases of extreme emergency. Now they couldn't require that. They only recommended that, but that's because they didn't have a treaty with all the other races that were warp capable. But this is an awful lot like our approach today to global warming. And you all know that in 1915, I'm sorry, in 2015, the countries of the world got together and developed the Paris Climate Agreement. And agreement may be a little bit strong. Maybe it should be called the 2015 Paris Climate Suggestions because it doesn't really have a lot of enforcement. But the idea was to hold the production of CO2, of greenhouse gases, at a certain level so that we wouldn't see catastrophic climate change. And as you know, the United States did not join in to that. Um, the Trump administration decided in its first weeks in office to pull out. Uh, other countries like China have not been complying. And in the last couple of years, you've seen a real increase in the CO2 levels. And you see that we're having the hottest years on record and we're having the worst storms ever. And so this November, there's going to be a new international climate conference to try to figure out, is the world now ready to do something more concrete? Or are we stuck with the international speed limit suggested on Star Trek approach? Now, a lot of uh, cases deal with terrorism and that is a major issue for the international community. In too short a season, the enterprise is transporting this admiral to planet Morgan or to negotiate the release of Federation hostages. And he tells Picard that he has had success with this world in the past because he negotiated an arms for hostage deal. Now, that's a good question. Can, can we give hostages arms in response, or, or terrorist arms in response for giving up hostages? Would that be a good idea? Well, it unfortunately has happened in the past. If you know anything about history during the Reagan administration, there was a little thing called the Iran-Contra affair where that was part of the problem. But even in modern times, this comes up with respect to pirates. So piracy is a major problem off the coast of Somalia, on both sides of Africa, in Asia, even in the Caribbean. And I'm not talking about Johnny Depp piracy. I'm talking about modern day pirates who Maybe they used to be fishermen, maybe they were terrorists, maybe they were um, drug traffickers, but now their choice of a um, employment is to capture vessels, kidnap people, hold them hostage. And you know what? They're really effective because 
the insurance companies are partnering with them. They are. The insurance companies are now offering higher rates to any countries that have cargo going through these pirate infected areas. And, and they say, listen, if your cargo ship is captured, we're going to negotiate the release of your crew and we'll pay a small ransom of a million or two dollars and, and they will you know, release even the cargo for you. And so here you have a picture actually of one of these ransom payments by an insurance company. They're dropping it by parachute down to the pirates. And this issue has come up like, should the insurance companies be paying off the pirates? Isn't the entire pirate model being fueled by the insurance companies? And the insurance companies are getting away as well because they're jacking up their prices. So in the United Kingdom, there was a bill that was introduced to parliament that would make it unlawful for anybody to pay ransoms to pirates or terrorists. And the idea was that that would you know, take away the, the business model, the price incentive to engage in piracy and terrorism. And guess what? It didn't pass. The people in the parliament said, oh, if you pass that you know, for a couple of years, they're gonna be killing our hostages. They're gonna be you know, seeing whether we're serious and, and that would be very unfair to the families of the victims. So we're just gonna go ahead and continue to pay the pirates. Guess what? That's the situation that continues to exist today. Interesting little side note, the US has on its books a law that says it is unlawful to give material support to terrorists and pirates who hijack and hostage take those are acts of terrorism. So in theory, that law could apply to the terrorists, but currently the Department of Justice and the courts have not seen fit to apply it. We're still in a world where the piracy pays. Interesting, just like in Star Trek. Um, here's another interesting one. In Ensign Row, Starfleet authorizes Captain Picard to offer amnesty to these Bajoran terrorists who have attacked a Federation settlement. And they are going to say basically, if you promise to discontinue your attacks on Federation outposts, we're just gonna look the other way and not hold you responsible. Does that ever happen in the real world? If there is a war criminal that's committed crimes against humanity, violations of the Geneva Convention, and there is a civil war and the war criminal says, hey, I will you know, join for peace, if you just promise not to prosecute me, does the international community say, okay, sure, we're gonna let you get away with it? Well, I hate to tell you, the answer is yes, just like on Star Trek. Here's an example. General Sedros took over Haiti. Here he is being shown next to his best friend right before he coup d'etat him, uh, President Aristide. Then the international community, as I mentioned earlier, authorized use of force, General Cedras fleed, uh, and you know where he went? He went to Panama. Uh, and here's a picture right behind our, our photographs on the right-hand side of the beautiful mansion that the United States arranged for him to have. Guess whose mansion that was, by the way? It was General Noriega, the former president of Panama that's in jail in the United States. The U.S. said, we'll give you a bigger jail cell you know, we'll talk about reducing your sentence. We'll give you, you know, more books, TV privileges, whatever you want, if you'll help us out with this. And he did. And so General Sedros, who committed crimes against humanity, there was massive rape and other acts of torture. He was given an international, you know, parachute uh, and, and a nice place to live. And he still lives there. So yeah, unfortunately, Star Trek got that right. Um, it's not always the case, you know, there are war criminals behind bars in The Hague, but it is still a problem, this tension between uh, prosecution and peace. Now, in a matter of perspective, there are local authorities who want the first officer, uh, Commander Riker, extradited to them for murdering a Dr. Nell Abgar. And there was some incriminating evidence that he was responsible. He said, I hate you. I wish you were dead. He did have an affair with Abgar's wife. I mean, it didn't look good for Captain Riker or for Commander Riker. But 
the Tanagran justice system employs a presumption of guilt. So the question was, will we extradite one of our own people to a place where instead of you are innocent until proven guilty, you are presumed guilty until you've proven your innocence. Well, the issue comes up in a slightly different way in the Heart of Glory, where Captain Picard is asked to hand over three Klingons who had commander, commandeered a Telerian, a Telerian ship and attacked a Klingon cruiser. And Mr. Worf, who is a Klingon that serves aboard the Starship Enterprise, he says, do you know that if you surrender them, they will be executed and then tried? That's the Klingon way. And, and that doesn't sound too fair. That sounds even less fair than a presumption of guilt, right? So the question is, in the real world, can a person use the trial justice system and the unfair trial processes as a defense to extradition? And that came up in a really famous case, the Jen Soaring extradition case. This case goes back to 1989, again, while I was at the State Department. What happens is Jen Soaring and his girlfriend are students at the University of Virginia. And her parents are wealthy and they have this big house near Charlottesville. And so she actually convinces her boyfriend, Jen, to go out and murder them so that the two of them can move into the house and live happily ever after. And Jen was from Germany but he was in love with her and he said, yes, dear, I'll do whatever you want. And so he murders the parents. And then things go wrong. The authorities are hot on their trail and he flees to the United Kingdom. Once he's in the United Kingdom, the United States requests his extradition and Virginia wants to give him the death penalty. He claims that there's something called the death row phenomenon and that in the United States, if he were to be surrendered to Virginia, he would spend 12 to 14 years on death row. And he says death row is a horrible place because there are orders to the prison guards not to intervene when there's a scuffle because these people have nothing to lose. So they're particularly dangerous. There are a lot of rapes that occur on death row. And he claimed that the prison guards were told to look the other direction and, and just allow things to go on. And he said that he was a particularly young and vulnerable person who would be subject to all of this abuse. So the European Court of Human Rights takes the case and they decide that this death row phenomenon is a reason why people cannot be extradited from any European country to the United States to face the death penalty. And the only way that Virginia could get Jen Soaring is if it dropped the death charge and brought it down to manslaughter which they did, and he ends up, I believe, uh, going back to Virginia, being tried and prosecuted. But it just goes to show you that in the real world, at least for the European Court of Human Rights, there is attention paid to the, the processes and the conditions that await you in extradition. Uh, whereas in Star Trek, it wasn't such a big deal, at least not for the Klingons. Um, and Riker, he got it. Uh, he, he proved his innocence ultimately. All right. Um, here's another issue. In Encounter at Farpoint, which is the very first of the Star Trek Next Generation episodes, Captain Picard asked Commander Riker, would you object to a clearly illegal kidnapping of the leader of the people named Groppler Zorn, who had in refuse to inform the enterprise of the nature of an attacking alien ship. And uh, they were all gonna just go down and, and kidnap this guy and, and you know force him to tell them what they needed to know. In fact, they do, they beam him up. There he is in the picture, the guy with the long hair standing there. Well, there's this omnipotent being, being named Q who materializes on board. He comes you know, every season to, uh, give a hard time to a poor Captain Picard. And in this case, he says, Captain Picard, you have condemned the entire human race because you have refused to follow even your own most basic rules. That is that you do not kidnap people. Uh, so what does this tell us? It tells us in Star Trek, you're not supposed to kidnap people, but sometimes for the greater good, Captain Picard will do it. What about in the real world? Well, the same thing happened just a couple years later in a very famous case called Alvarez Machine. 
And it all started where a DEA agent who was undercover named Kiki Camarena was uh, found and tortured. And as part of the torture, a doctor named Alvarez Machine kept him alive. And the drug cartels in Mexico wanted to know who else was undercover and they tortured him and ultimately killed him. I don't know whether he did give the information or not, but the DEA in San Diego, who he was associated with, was pretty angry about all of this. And they knew if the US requested Alvarez Machine from his extradition from Mexico, that they would not comply because he was a Mexican citizen and Mexico had a clause in their treaty that said they would not extradite their own citizens. So they went down from San Diego across the border into Mexico. They found Alvarez Machine. They kidnapped him. They stuck him, in, stuck him in the trunk in the car. They brought him back to San Diego and they were gonna prosecute him. His case goes all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And the issue was, if you kidnap someone in violation of international law and violation of a treaty, must you dismiss the case or can you just prosecute them anyway? And our dear Supreme Court in 1992 decided you could prosecute them anyway. They said there might have been violations of international law, but it was not relevant to whether he could be prosecuted. So he was prosecuted. Uh, and that goes to show you that uh, the situation in Star Trek was not quite the same uh, because um, we don't have some omnipotent being who is more powerful than the Supreme Court to tell us that we must comply with our own rules. Um, this case then became a precedent for a lot of other kidnappings. Uh, a recent one was where the United States sent special forces into Libya without Libya's permission. And they kidnapped some terrorists and, and brought them back. And the US says, listen, we can do that because we're exercising self-defense and it is very limited incursion on your territorial sovereignty. And we knew that if we brought the person back in the United States, the Supreme Court precedent said, it didn't matter how they got there through extradition or kidnapping, we can prosecute them. So this is still going on today. All right, what about um, the idea of asylum? In the mind's eye, this Klingon special emissary, Kel, who's accused of being an accomplice of a Romulan plot to assassinate the Klingon colonel, requests asylum aboard the Enterprise rather than face Klingon justice, which I described earlier. Well, what happens in the real world when someone says, I want asylum, I don't wanna face US justice? You know this guy? It's Julian Assange, the head of WikiLeaks. And the United States uh, wanted him when he was in England. And so we requested his extradition. Well, he ran to the Ecuador embassy and he said, Ecuador, please uh, give me asylum. And then the United States said, we want him because he is accused of sexual assaults. But the real reason he said the US wanted him was because of WikiLeaks. It was embarrassing to the United States and it was disrupting the elections and that he would get an unfair trial if he was sent to the United States. Well, Ecuador let him stay in their embassy, gave him asylum for a long time until finally he became so disruptive, they basically persona non grata him. They said, You're, we're done with you, go away. And, and off he went, um, he was back in London and the United States tried to get his extradition and um, not exactly sure where he is today. If, if any of you know the, the latest uh, chapter on Julian Assange, you can update us. Um, but it goes to show you that this issue of asylum that was raised in Star Trek, it also happens in the real world. What about um, this idea of torture? And you know, can you torture a terrorist if you need to, to get the information? Um, in the case of the episode, chain of command. Captain Picard goes undercover. He's a spy and he goes to Kardashian and he gets caught and they decide to torture him. And he says, oh, you can't torture me. It's expressly prohibited by their equivalent of the Geneva Conventions governing the treatment of prisoners of war. And the Kardashians say, well, you're not entitled to that protection because you were a spy. 
And that raises the question of, do the, the torture convention and the Geneva conventions on the protection of prisoners of war, do they have different rules for terrorists or spies? Well, we all know this came up after 9-11 and, and the, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is in just a couple of days. So this is very relevant. It comes up because the United States gets its hands on a number of people that it thinks are terrorists from Afghanistan. And it brings them to black sites around the world, including at Guantanamo Bay. And it subjects them to extraordinary interrogation techniques, including waterboarding. Some of them were waterboarded. And here's a picture of waterboarding. It basically makes you feel like you're drowning. Um, they were waterboarded as many as 175 times. Now, various US presidents, various courts have said waterboarding is a form of torture. The US at first came up with this argument that, well, it may be torture, but we can do that in order to get information to protect ourselves from terrorists. Then they came up with this argument that the torture convention and the Geneva conventions, they don't apply on Guantanamo Bay. They only apply in US territory. But the Supreme Court said, no, Guantanamo Bay is a US base in Cuba, and we have so much jurisdiction over that that our rules of due process apply there. And so, you know, ultimately, um, there were several people who were waterboarded so many times that even though there's no evidence to prosecute them, uh, we can't let them go. And we can't prosecute them even if there were evidence because the evidence would be thrown out because it was, you know, developed through these coercive uh, tactics. So, you know, this, this issue that came up in Star Trek a couple of years earlier, it became a really big issue that's still haunting the United States. Uh, I know that we're coming toward the end and I wanna hear some of your questions. So a couple of other ones. Um, in this one, the use of force in self-defense. In one of the episodes, Redemption, Starfleet uh, sends an armada to block a Romulan convoy that's suspected of supplying forces to overthrow the Klingon Empire in a civil war. And this was an awful lot like the US Cuban Missile Crisis, where the United States thought, knew that the Soviet Union was supplying nuclear weapons to Cuba. Here you have a map, the yellow triangles are where the nuclear missile sites are. And so what the US did is we put a blockade, a naval blockade around Cuba. I didn't know until I saw this map that the blockade wasn't just around Cuba. It also extended to the Dominican Republic and Haiti and Jamaica. Um, and so, um, and, and it wasn't with any of their approval, we just did it. And we turned the Soviet ships away. The Soviet Union said, listen, you can't do that under international law. And the United States says we can because this is our right of self-defense. So, you know, this issue from Star Trek, it, it has historic roots. But this idea of anticipatory self-defense, that's a little bit more controversial. In one of the Star Trek episodes, The Wounded, Starfleet orders the Enterprise to prevent a Federation starship commanded by Captain Ben Maxwell from attacking Kardashian vessels. And he says, listen, I know that those vessels are preparing for a military offensive against the Federation. I'm just taking a first strike. So, what about in international law? If you know that there is an enemy that is preparing to strike you, can you strike first? If we had gotten the plans of the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor, could we have gone and met the Japanese fleet halfway through the Pacific? Or did we have to wait for that attack to occur to use self-defense? That's sort of the question. Well, the question comes up in modern times. Iran is developing nuclear facilities. Israel has claimed that it is contemplating preemptive self-defense strikes against those nuclear facilities. Also, during the Trump administration, the US said we were contemplating preemptive strikes against North Korea's nuclear facilities. It's basically the same issue, and it's the same outcome. The couple of times when countries have used preemptive self-defense in this context, the international community has condemned it and said, listen, unless a strike is really imminent, you know, it's, it's ongoing or it's about to happen, you can't strike first, um, even if it, it ends up, you know, for the good of humanity. 
by getting rid of dangerous weapons. So that's sort of where international law is today. But these issues are still ripe to be decided and could change international law, which evolves from state practice. All right, so we do have a couple of minutes left and I'm eager to hear your questions. Um, what I'm gonna do is ask uh, um, Eric Seiler uh, to do two things. One, Eric, can you please read the information for those people who need CLE credit? And two, can you read out any questions um, that are coming in through chat and, and I'll answer them. Oh, certainly. Um, <clears throat> Let me start with the first question. The, first, the Federation stands for the fundamental equality of sentient life, yet also the internal auditory of individual planets, which may be contradictory. Does international law do the same? And if so, how does that affect the law? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. The whole concept of international law that we have today goes all the way back to the Peace of Westphalia that ended the 80 years war. And it was based on this concept that Hugo Grotius came up with. And the concept was that each country, no matter how big or small, should have autonomy. And what it does inside its own territory, it should be its own business. And all countries should be equal on the international you know, sphere. And in some ways, that's true. The United Nations has 192 parties. They, they're all in the General Assembly. They all get one vote. Now, the Security Council uh, gives five countries a veto. So they did recognize that some countries were first among equals. Other international organizations have weighted voting, like the World Bank. Um, and so they're, they're moved away from the no matter how small you are concept everybody is equal, but for the most part, that's international law. Also, for the most part, what a country did in its own territory was its own business until World War II, when Germany started having concentration camps, rounding up Jews, killing people in its own territory and in the territories it controlled. And after Germany, the Nuremberg trial developed a new concept that is now part of modern international law. And that is that when countries do certain things that are so egregious, like crimes against humanity, you know, that's systematic mass crimes against the civilian population, or violations of the grave breaches provisions of the Geneva Conventions, or other kinds of war crimes or genocide, then the international community has a right to intervene. So the UN Charter, which um, was written at the time of Nuremberg, has two clauses, you know, one clause that says that the Security Council can authorize force, when there's a threat to peace and security. And another clause that says that the UN is going to basically leave countries alone for things that are essentially in their domestic sphere. And that is the tension that the question raises. It's a tension that international law has to deal with. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it used to be that the Security Council would say, when a situation spills over the borders, then we can go in. But in more modern times, starting with Haiti and then Rwanda and then in uh, Kosovo, um, the Security Council now says, if you commit certain horrible crimes, that's enough for the international community to, to be interested in going in. But that's only if the Security Council authorizes it. The US has argued in the case of Syria and its use of chemical weapons, that countries can go in without Security Council authorization when chemical weapons are being used. and um, when they did that, some of the countries in the world objected, some of the countries approved. So this is uh, basically a question that's still being resolved in international law. Great question. Okay, uh, next question is, does endorsing breaking the prime directive mean Janaway is a war criminal for failing to help so many dying species? <laughs> yeah, you know, so the prime directive, it's important because um, the Federation is very advanced and there was concern that if they got involved in, in the affairs of less advanced countries, for example, um, if the Klingons were arming one side and the Federation was arming another, like in one of the episodes, the original Star Trek, that that would be a really bad idea. And so they came up with this idea that until a country has work, You've, or a world has warped, you've got to leave them alone. You've got to let them develop on their own. You can't interfere. 
But so often in Star Trek, it's clear that the right thing to do is to intervene, that the Enterprise crew with all their best intentions sometimes should do what's right. And so there must be dozens of episodes where they talk about how they're breaking their own law in order to do what's right. And, and it's an issue that comes up in international law as well. It's, it's the issue with humanitarian intervention. You know, the international law says you can't do it, but sometimes it's really, really the right thing to do. In a case like Rwanda, um, when there was genocide, 800,000 people were being killed. Just a couple of thousand troops could have stopped it. And yet at that time, the international community said, we're, we're gonna stay out. And they were so shamed by that that they are now more inclined, like they are in Star Trek, to intervene. Uh, now, is Janeway a war criminal for intervening or would she be a war criminal for not intervening when she had the ability to stop genocide from occurring? That's the real question. Next question is, to what extent do writers of Star Trek of the Star Trek series consult with IHL or human rights experts in preparation for the script slash storylines? Yeah, Gene Roddenberry wrote a book. He was the original um, producer and creator of Star Trek. Um, when Star Trek, the original series had just gone off the air and he was describing how they came up with the ideas and they consulted all kinds of experts. They consulted domestic lawyers for issues of domestic law, international experts, um, whoever they, they could, they would consult. And I think that in all the Star Trek series, they've continued to do that. Um, here's a little interesting thing. There is a television series out now called Blood and Treasure. And its executive producer is a friend of uh, Thomas and Christian and mine. Um, it's a guy named Mark Blaskett, who's an international lawyer. And he actually consults with them about the international law on this television series. Um, it was a big hit series two years ago, and it's coming back this fall or in the winter. So look out for it. But gee, you know, we're living in a world now where they're hiring executive producers or international lawyers so that they can get the law right. I think that's fantastic. Next question is, why in Soaring with the decision to extradite was not decided by England, but by European court? Ah, so all the countries in Europe have joined this convention called the European Convention for Human Rights, and it creates the European Court of Human Rights. And what it says is that when there is a human rights issue, and it has gone through the, the domestic courts, which it had gone through the UK courts, it can then be appealed to this international court. And because England has joined this treaty, giving away its sovereignty to allow that, it is, a, it is bound by that treaty and by that court. The US has not done that. I mean, the closest we have is there's an inter-American court of human rights, and it has much less power than the court, the European court. Um, but there have been cases involving the United States and what we've done that have gone up before that court as well. How does international law achieve consistency and predictability when it is so incident dependent and leader dependent as time passes? All right, so in international law, there's two sources of law. There are treaties, also called international conventions. A convention is a treaty involving not just two parties, but many. And then there's customary international law, which comes about through widespread state practice out of a sense of legal obligation. Now, over time, this body in the UN called the International Law Commission has been taking all the customary international law and codifying it into treaties. And then countries will ratify the treaties and it's binding on them. And when they do a treaty, it's in writing. It's very specific, although quite honestly, there's a lot of ambiguity written in the treaties as, as well, but it, it's in black and white. You can read it and you know what the law is. Customary international law, it, it usually comes out of long-term state practice. They call it crystallization because it takes so long. But nowadays, there are situations where customary international law is occurring very quickly. And there are um, academics like myself that call those Groschen moments, named after Hugo Grotius. And it's true, when you have 
law that can be created quickly out of state practice and the squishy idea of a sense of legal obligation, um, and you don't have a treaty, then it, it is a less, it's less predictable. And, and for that reason, it's scary to countries. They're, they're not that excited about the idea of quick customary international law or accelerated customary international law. And yet it, it is definitely happening out there. So it is one of those really interesting controversies in international law that you've hit on. Okay, great. Uh, looks like our time is up. Um, do you want okay, to- Don't forget to tell everybody the code, Eric. Sure, do you want to do a wrap up and then I can present the code? Sure, um, my wrap up is, listen, happy Star Trek day. I hope that um, this presentation has gotten you excited about international law, the many controversies that are still going on. It's a very exciting field. And also Star Trek, it's still relevant. Go off and watch it. There's still several series and upcoming movies and we can celebrate that. Um, so thank you, uh, Red Cross for co-hosting this. Um, and thank you, Eric and uh, Martin and the staff at Case Western Reserve. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Over to you.